There we go. Got it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you for the invitation to give this lecture. Uh, and I uh, will be introducing uh, the Quran Computing Institute and its um, initiatives and efforts uh, towards um, a, a application development of AI applications um, related to the Quran, Islamic sciences, and the Arabic language as well. So a little bit of introduction, and then we'll dive into the technical applications. Um, the International Computing Institute for Quran and Islamic Sciences is a U.S. nonprofit organization made of a group of members who represent diverse scientific and humanitarian universities, colleges, research centers, or technology companies, sorry, across the world, uh, with an interest in computing sciences for Quran, Islamic sciences, and Arabic language. Uh, our vision is to provide that global leadership and uh, represent the reference in computing for the Holy Quran, Islamic sciences, and the Arabic language. And our mission is to establish and develop a solid scientific reference for computing, develop research, specialized scientific studies, computer programs, websites, th through distinguished uh, institutional, sus sustainable institutional work, and to cooperate and coordinate with institutions and individuals specialized in computer sharia and linguistic fields, who enable an integrated, which enables an integrated vision with distinguished outputs. Um, there are nine objectives for the Institute. Uh, the first is to, like I mentioned, uh, establish a digital scientific reference for computer data and information for the Holy Quran, Islamic sciences, and Arabic language, and anything related to those fields. Forming a platform for researchers and professionals interested in such applications to connect and coordinate the efforts between them. Establish scientific partnerships between specialists and individuals and institutions. Setting standards and controls for data that are dealt with in the fields, in these fields. Developing and training researchers and those interested in computing in noble Quran and, um, and Islamic sciences and the Arabic language. So uh, uh, while preparing for a training material as well. Uh, opening channels of communication uh, between these different uh, three different disciplines of um, uh, computing, Sharia, and linguistics, and encouraging scientific research in the fields of computing, uh, dissemination of that knowledge so that there is public awareness, and encouraging uh, uh, scientific and electronic productions and open source software. Those are the objectives. This is our website, QuranComputing.org. I invite you to visit it and explore it, explore the uh, feed, uh, the uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, so there are some projects that we announce uh, as well as uh, uh, key members uh, presentations uh, and activities for the Institute. And uh, at the bottom there is our uh, URL for uh, membership. Uh, it's free membership. So I uh, invite you guys to to join and uh, uh, keep to keep track of um, progress of information um, in the Institute. And there are, uh, every now and then, there are um, educational uh, seminars being offered um, uh, uh, for members. Uh, and these are our social um, uh, networks, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, I invite you to also check it out and, and subscribe as you like. All right. Um, so today I'll, I'll be talking about um, uh, a few topics. Um, the first is about development of the Quran databases um, and how to query those databases with natural language uh, using LLM application, large language model applications and using LangSheet. Um, so inference using LLM models um, is, uh, you know, great, but I think it, but it still has issues with generative AI, with AI uh, LLM models. Um, so inference is usually uh, by an LLM is done based on its understanding of language. And that understanding is developed over the course of training and error reduction during the training phase. Um, so there are, uh, during the training, there are linguistic features, the patterns, the grammar of the, 
of the language, um, the uh, it's it extracted. Um, uh, it's uh, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, and and essentially derived. The relationships are derived from the patterns within the input data, uh, and it is uh, represented in a numeric fashion. Right. So, um, and so data is presented to the model as. Uh, what's called embeddings, which is a kind of an encoding scheme uh, from converting the text into a uh, numbers. Um, and then uh, these numbers are clustered together so that there are groupings between them. Um, and, uh, so that different words that are uh, uh, joined together more often are, you know, have uh, become more at more proximity to each other. Um, yes, and that's, uh, that is true across languages. So for example, if I say the word dog in English and kelp in Arabic, those mean the same thing, have the same semantic meaning, and therefore you will find them uh, within proximity of each other, right? So they are clustered together. Um, uh, the, the generated uh, LLM, uh, these relationships that are built between the uh, the uh, words uh, in a sentence or between sentences um, uh, carries with it statistical probability because you are essentially uh, trying to take a sequence of words and predicting the next word that will follow. Um, and that prediction carries with it a statistical probability. Um, the more often that word is encountered, that that next word is generated, the higher that statistical probability is. Um, but because of that statistical probability, uh, if you ask the same question twice for the LLM, you might get two different answers, okay, or slightly different answers, but not exactly the same necessarily, okay. Um, and uh, even worse than that. If the information you've requested, the LLM, uh, it doesn't have that knowledge base, um, and you've asked them for information that it doesn't have, it, it tries to generate it on the fly, even though it might be false, okay, or uh, not factual. And that is called uh, hallucinations, essentially. Um, so, you know, generating information on the fly is okay for. Um, when you're trying to write a fiction story, you know, that is uh, not grounded, not truthful, a, something or imaginative. But when you're trying to write a scientific article, um, you want things to be factual. And even more so, when, you, when it comes to the Quran and the Hadith, it has to be 100% accurate uh, with no changes whatsoever. Um, so how do we deal with that? The Quran and Hadith is sensitive data, right? Uh, it cannot be changed. It cannot be created generatively on, on the fly or approximated, right? Uh, I, about a year ago, when I was uh, asking GPT-4, you know, give me this verse from this Quran, uh, sorry, give me this verse from the Surah, um, it would give me uh, a verse that has altered uh, uh, wordings and maybe a word deleted, a word added, uh, another word used in substitution by meaning. Um, and it scared me uh, pretty much. And one time I even asked a question uh, about the Quran and it gave me a verse from the Bible. Uh, so it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like really scary. Um, so, I, and for this to be a the spokesman about uh, uh, delivering the Islam uh, uh, answering and addressing Islam, uh, questions about Islam to the public is very dangerous. Uh, so really, uh, we felt the urge and the need to create an initiative to address this issue. Um, uh, over time, it, they've gotten better, but uh, you know, without uh, having that ability to, uh, I mean, with with with, no matter how much training you do. Uh, fine tuning and retraining that that um, statistical distribution and probabilistic sense of generating and and predictive predictively the next word uh, will always have that risk associated with it that you you know of of altering words. 
So we really need to have a more deterministic way. When it comes to Quran and Hadith, sensitive data like that, we want a database that's authenticated, that's verified, um, and validated. And you just you you can and then you query that database to bring that information that you have confidence in, and present that data to the user. So um, and that is known as drag, okay, uh, or retrieval augmented generation. Um, you retrieve the data from the database and you augment the prompt that you give uh, with, uh, the prompt from the user. You augment that with this information from the database, feed it to the model, the LLM model, and let it take all that context sh to shape the answer back to, uh, or the response back to the user, right? So now that it has the information given to it in the prompt, it will uh, not be able to, uh, sorry, it will not falsify. It will not have a need to predict, all right? But rather, it's, it's given this input, it's going to just shape it uh, in the format uh, in the response. All right, so... Um, and so there's always this question, uh, do we, what's training, what's fine tuning, what is retrieval? And, and essentially training is when you take a language model with from the start, from the beginning with randomized weights, right? Uh, that have not yet been seen data or trained on data. Uh, and the process of training is to iterate over the, uh, the, 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 the uh, adaptation of these weights in order to minimize the a error between the the actual the actual output of from the network model uh, or um, the model network and then and the actual uh, actual uh, next word that you sh that uh, is known from the training data. So uh, by minimizing the distance or the uh, the error between the uh, prediction and the actual uh, 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 output, uh, then, or the truthful output, then we minimize the error. And that network over time starts to reduce its error and uh, becomes more, more and more uh, accurate. Um, but then that takes a lot of time. And um, uh, a model like Llama, uh, maybe it took like 1.7 million hours of GPU, GPU hours to train, you know? Uh, so uh, lots of compute time and, and, and very expensive. Uh, so uh, pretty much uh, not, uh, not something that uh, most institutions can do, you know? Um, all right, so then what we can do is fine tuning a model, and that is a partial training. Essentially, we take the network, we we change the weights partially um, with fine tuning, um, and uh, and essentially adapt it to new data, adapt an existing model to new new data of our, that that is ours that we would like to add this knowledge base to the to to the um, knowledge that this model was trained on. Okay, so we do fine tuning, uh, essentially. And um, th the problem with fine tuning is that you still have a network that is still probabilistic in its nature. And there is still that um, a chance and, pro you know, of, of it inferring wrongly, because it is um, uh, hallucinating or, or predicting with, uh, you know, some probabilist in a probabilistic sense, the predictions. So, what do we do then? Is we, you know, fine tuning is good when you have a large body of knowledge that you want to adapt this model to. But when you have limited text or limited uh, um, uh, input. Uh, you can using RAG, especially when that input is sensitive, like the Quran or the Hadith, using retrieval augmented generation is a much better um, uh, scenario of uh, kind of uh, uh, or structure for uh, uh, leveraging data from a database that's authenticated, validated, and 
uh, and presenting it to the user in that sense. So that's that's pretty much the choice. Like for example, we have uh, Al Maktab al Shamila, which is uh, a huge library uh, uh, that is published from the uh, the Prophet's uh, Masjid in in Medina al Munawwara, um, that has about forty thousand books, and it is uh, uh, that that these books span the knowledge base across the fourteen hundred fifty years or so. Uh, of Islamic knowledge or so, you know, of Islam. So it's a huge, very important library. And uh, um, uh, if you just look at Shamila and you will find it, and I'll, uh, I'll be happy to provide a URL link to it as well. Um, so we have uh, a, a copy of that. And I did uh, count uh, the words. It's about uh, 23 billion words um, made of 12 million unique words. Okay, so it's a large body of text. And so to you can't really use drag on that, right? It's, uh, it's too much of information to be uh, exploring uh, a on the fly kind of uh, uh, with, with uh, queries with, from a database kind of. So um, uh, especially that it's not structured uh, as well. Right, so it's just text of books, right? So different formats, different content, etc. Uh, so with that, we can do fine tuning on. That's, there is no real, no real issue if you express the same sentence in slightly different wording, but meaning the same way, same thing, right? Or uh, it's not holy text in other words, right? But Quran and Hadith have a different status, and those have to be hundred percent exactly the same, reproducible every time. And for that, we can use RAC. All right. Um, so the steps of uh, uh, doing a model uh, fine tuning typically uh, takes the steps of data preparation, where you convert data from text to JSON uh, for file formats, right? Uh, for example, these JSON file formats can contain a question answer pa pair or a language translation pair between original and, and uh, translated language or a sentence completion for prompts, or a text summary. Uh, so those are the JSON files. Those can be used for uh, essentially, when you fine tune, you're giving not only new knowledge uh, to the model, you can also give it new skills, right? Like each of those question answer or translation or sentence completion or text summary or bulletization or taking uh, determining actions you know, from a text. Um, uh, those are all uh, skills that you give the model by presenting it with a lot of examples, like let's say hundreds of examples, okay? Uh, and then when you do the fine tuning over that, now this model learns a new skill set, okay? But also you can give it new knowledge by uh, doing fine tuning on new, uh, a lot of data. Uh, let's say in the in the format of sentence in the se format of sen um, sentence prediction or sentence completion, so predicting the next word, kind of. Um, but this text as an input, what you need to do is we need to uh, convert it from text to numbers. Uh, so that's called tokenization or creating an embeddings. Okay, and the embedding is essentially a vector of numbers. Uh, so every word. Has that um, has that uh, uh, is converted is tokenized um, uh, like split into syllables, for example. Right, that tokenization process is is unique for every language. So, for example, you know English. Maybe we can split words by syllables. In Arabic, we can do the same, but I don't recommend it. Uh, there are tokenizers today that does that actually syllable by like how you pronounce the words kind of uh, the tokenization or or kind of splitting the word into those uh, and I don't recommend that I recommend way uh, uh, to to use um the um the the the, the uh, uh sarf which is uh you know how in, in Arabic, we have the root of the word, and you can it can change its morphology uh, to to different uh, types of types of uh, uh, forms um, to adapt it 
for uh, in, uh, to, to its uh, meaning. So sarf, uh, or for example, if you add a, a pronoun to it, etc., or append, uh, uh, append or prepend something to the word, you, then using the rules of sarf, or uh, you know, you can actually um, uh, have a better tokenization mechanism. So that's uh, an area for exploration and research and de development. Um, uh, so and we we have excellent uh, software uh, that's been developed for all, that really describes all the rules of surf for 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 Arabic language, um, and I think it contains like twelve million words uh, or something of that nature. Um, so taking that database and applying it to develop a new token tokenizer is something of interest. Uh, if anyone uh, has an has an interest in collaborating in that area, um, the other way the other thing is that. Fine tuning um, is also expensive. Uh, I mean, the, even though you're not starting from scra scratch to train um, a model from scratch, uh, you are starting from a tra already trained model, but then adding new knowledge or skill set. If the skill set can be learned quickly over a few hundred, uh, you know, examples, but if it's a new knowledge like the Maktab al Shamila, and I mentioned like twenty three billion, you know, words. Okay, well, it might take a little longer, right? So and be more expensive. So how do we optimize uh, cost like that? So one way is to do uh, use this uh, uh, CLORA, uh, which is quantized low rank adapters. Um, and by training in low rank, you are essentially uh, minimizing the changes to the um, uh, to the uh, network, right? So you're only training what's necessary, what, how, how, which input, uh, which, uh, you know, how the input is, uh, affecting the output. You're training partially the network. Uh, and by quantization, we mean that these weights, uh, a lot of these models come with 7 billion or or 13 billion or, or uh, uh, 70 billion you know, weights. So the, the larger the network supposedly is that the more capable it is, but that, that uh, means that it's gonna be more expensive computationally, more memory, more, more cost, to training it or fi even fine tuning it. Uh, so you can, if you change these weights instead of 32 bit, make it down to 88 bit or four bit, uh, then you can accelerate significantly the process of training uh, and memory requirements and, and hardware cost. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, finally, once you have a trained model, you will serve it for inference on the web and there are different uh, ways you can serve or host this model. Any scale that come in San Francisco actually um, offers a really an excellent um, a, a, a cost point for serving uh, serving models. For example, for a llama, uh, two uh, a million tokens uh, of inference, you know, cost a dollar. You know, so that's about a thousand questions or so. Um, so. The other way, um, uh, so we, uh, we talked about RAG, uh, retrieval from a database, but how do we connect a model uh, with this uh, uh, ability to retrieve information from a database? So there is this thing called function or function calling. And uh, in commercial uh, large language models like uh, GPT or ChatGPT, they offer these uh, a, a function calling, um, and that's how they're able to do plugins, or you can, you're able to develop a plugin for um, GBT. Uh, so, for example, there is a plugin for uh, Hadith uh, called uh, Sahih AI, and there's another one called Hadith Advisor. Um, the developers for these models are both members of our institute. Um, and I uh, have provided the, the Sahih AI is an open source, by the way. Uh, so I provided a link for that in the, I think one, a few, uh, the next few slides. Um, but essentially function calling allows you to uh, detect, detect a pattern in the input from the user. And if, if that pattern matches the description of the function, then immediately uh, GPT will uh, uh, will invoke that function, 
right? We'll call it. And then that function will go out to a database, does a query, um, uh, so, uh, and bring back the results back to the ChatGPT. Some functions require input, a certain format of an input, maybe different arguments of, of inputs. And the, the JSON file that describes the function has a description of it. What, when do you call it? What what's its role is? What its function is? And then what are the input required inputs? And the the uh, GPT four will will pass in the data as inputs and uh, and invoke that function as soon as there is a proximity between its description of its function and what the user prompt uh, requests. Okay. Um, and then that function will be invoked. It brings data back and feeds it to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, LLM. So that's how Sahih AI and Hadith Advisor are able to um, uh, present Hadith um, uh, to the GPT and so that it can output it to the user in the proper um, uh, text um, and, and the proper format. Um, so uh, typically, uh, uh, so that's what is done on commercial LLMs for, um, a uh, you know, sorry. Uh, um, the, yeah, so essentially you have this uh, a plugin that you can develop on data that, that is public. What about data that's private to you? Like not data that you wanna share with the public, but data that's private on your PC. How do you deal with that? And that is called, uh, uh, there are libraries called Langchain uh, that allows you to retrieve data from a private database on your local PC or an Excel sheet or a PDF file or a Word document or a set of documents and be able to essentially query, query those, load them, uh, create an embedding for them, which is a numeric representation of text and and um, and then a, a, a query that that embedding pass it to the LLM uh, for to shape the response uh, to the back to the user. We'll we'll see a few examples of that. I'll I'll present a few examples of that today. Um, I wanted to say you know commercial LLMs are like uh, you know GPT, Bard, or Cloud. Uh, these are some references to function calling uh, with these, but open source LLMs like Falcon, LL, Llama 2, or Mistral, those don't have function calling. Out of the box, they come without the ability to call functions, right? Um, uh, so you have to train them. It's a function calling is a new skill you give to these open sources. Uh, open source LLMs, right? And how do you give that skill? You fine tune it on a few examples of how to call functions, right? And so uh, there is this uh, link at the bottom here uh, that uh, provides uh, a uh, provides tools uh, for uh, and open source scripts uh, that you can use to fine tune any op open source LLM to be able to do function calling, okay? Um, beside function calling, now we wanna do Langchain, right? So, and I said Langchain is this library of tools that uh, allow you to develop applications using large language models. And, um, and these applications may include querying a database, you know, with information uh, so that the data you present to the user is factual and complete and maybe real time, maybe connected to the internet so that that data is co coming from an internet in real time fashion and fed into the database, uh, into the LLM. Okay, so this is the link for uh, the Sahih AI uh, open source. Uh, by the way, I'll I'll provide all the slides and uh, to uh, Brother Yusuf to share with you guys. So you don't have to worry about the uh, getting the links or anything like that. All right. Um, and um, uh, so uh, we have several paths uh, for, for, we have projects within uh, the Institute of several paths. Uh, all, all of these five areas are areas of interest. We 
you know, would love help uh, in, in these development and as a learning opportunity and at the same time, but it's all on volunteer basis, right? So, uh, so developing a plugin for the Quran, in addition to these Hadith plugins, uh, developing a RAG application for the Quran and Hadith with open source models, uh, develop fine tuning uh, the open source LLM on um, a, a, a Arabic language corpus of uh, Maktab al Shamila, um, using the uh, a, an open source model to translate in Maktab al Shamila to English. This is a body of text that is spans 1450 years ago, has been locked in Arabic language for a very long, for all this time, except very minor, you know, uh, uh, books that were able to be translated. Uh, now we, with with this LLM being able to be a function as a translator, naturally translator, um, we can, uh, uh, we have a good chance at translating in Maktab al into English. Uh, so that, uh, you know, non-Arab speaking uh, uh, Muslims around the world, who are more than Arabs actually, can benefit from this knowledge as well. Um, and Mistral, uh, as an open source uh, LLM, uh, is capable of 200 languages. It speaks Arabic as well. Uh, so that's a good uh, uh, open source model that we can uh, start with uh, to do this uh, this type of translation, right? And I mentioned being able to do Clora uh, for efficient training or fine tuning um, of um, of LLMs. Uh, there are two tools that are key. One called Ludwig from Uber, and that allows us to uh, do this quantized uh, low rank adapter um, uh, development uh, by only changing a configuration file called YAML. Um, and so that's easy to use, doesn't really require a lot of coding, uh, or it's, it's just pretty much uh, changing configuration uh, to describe the input data and you know the, uh, the parameters you need to do for, for fine tuning. And then there is another tool called Text Generation Web UI uh, uh, that is also available on um, uh, Hugging Face, which is a website, open source website for the world's largest open source, um, you know, repository for models, data, and code uh, re for AI. So, text generation web UI is a GUI-based uh, fine tuning. You can you don't have to program anything. You can load the model, you can load your data, and you can start the fine tuning process. You can even do the quantization and all of that, uh, all from the GUI. You don't have to program anything. Um, so that's pretty good tool. And I'll show you uh, uh, some a demo of that a little bit. Uh, not the uh, fine tuning, but just a demo of the of the tool. Uh, it is an open source. It's available also. Here are some links uh, for where you can find uh, text generation web UI at the bottom here, bottom right, and a YouTube video for uh, installation and all that. All right. And then when you have a model, you want to serve it to the world, and you need good computing power and scalability, reliability and low cost, I do recommend any scale uh, because they have something called Ray platform and Ray is a platform for um, distributed computing, training and serving and inference of, of these uh, LLM, serving models essentially. But, and not just language models, a lot, any type of uh, deep learning models. Uh, I do wanna mention uh, Dr. Walid Qadus, who is in San Francisco, this company is in San Francisco. Dr. Walid Padus is a chief science, science officer for that company, a good uh, a friend of mine and a member of our uh, Quran Computing Institute. Um, uh, he developed Ansari, the chat, and Ansari, I'll show you a quick demo of it. Um, all right, uh, let's, uh, sorry. Uh, so let's just start on another session. This is Ansari. Uh, it's a chat engine, Islamic chat engine, built on top of GPT-4. And it speaks um, uh, uh, multilingual, it's multilingual. It can speak Arabic as well, and English and French and uh, Urdu, you know. Um, and uh, essentially we can, uh, you can talk to it and say, um, 
what are uh, the pillars of Islam, for example. Um, and it, it's just, it's a great chat engine. Uh, right. Uh, so now, why is this better than uh, GPT-4? Two things. The first is prompt engineering. It defines the personality of GPT-4 so that it is leverages um, a, the character or or presents itself as a as a as a Sunni Muslim character essentially, right? So, and it tries to uh, essentially tries to uh, uh, select a, a personality for GPT-4 out of probably 10,000 personalities that GPT-4 has, right? Because of the volume of data that it was trained on. Now you have to, out of these 10,000 personalities, just select one that is well-defined for this for this role. And on top of that, it uses RAG um, by querying a, a database from an app called Kalimat, um, a, an app that has Quran uh, uh, text and hadith text. It queries it and brings the data whenever there is a need to inquire about uh, a hadith, for example, you know. Uh, you can say, uh, uh, give me uh, hadith uh, on hajj, you know, for example. I don't know what it will. You know, it. So, so here is uh, <clears throat> uh, so it just selected the hadith and gave it to you, right? So you can query it in many ways and forms. But just wanted to present it to you. And Ansari is also open source, uh, so uh, which is great because uh, here is the link for it, uh, and you can look at how Dr. Walid um, uh, architected it, uh, structured it and build build similar engines or applications um, using that uh, kind of uh, as a reference. Uh, there's also another net called um, uh, Ionet. Uh, this was built by uh, Arab uh, entrepreneurs and startups. Um, and Ionet is a, a kind of a provides decentralized GPU renting. So we all hear about AW renting GPUs from Amazon and, and NVIDIA and uh, uh, Azure as centralized clouds uh, and Google as centralized clouds. But um, uh, the decentralized clouds where, you know, there's GPUs across the world, across the globe, uh, doesn't matter where they come from. We just, uh, it just brings them into the uh, configuration uh, and the uh, and, uh, platform that you want to use for computing. And um, io.net runs Ray, Ray software. Uh, so it, it, it has this Ray layer that manages all these GPUs, right? So, so it's kind of, you're insulated as a user from the complexity behind the scenes in managing these GPUs and where they are exactly and, and how, how they um, perform. All right. Um, GPU renting from NVIDIA as a reference is, uh, you know, much cheaper than owning one, actually. Uh, so, you know, from NVIDIA, you can rent an H100 for $2 an hour or eight of them for like 20, 20 bucks an hour. Um, and H100s are really at the top of the uh, computing kind of uh, performance. H200 recently released is about twice of that. Uh, so, um uh, Really, and you know, renting from the manufacturer is offers you advantage. Okay, I will uh, quickly. I don't know how much time we have. Um, well, we have about fifteen minutes. We should we should be finished now. But I'll, I'll try to quickly uh, uh, go through this because this, I, I think it's, this is the fun part. Um, the first, I want to show you a Rakim uh, Quran. Um, uh, database. This is software that I developed. Uh, used uh, here it is. Uh, it's developed using a um, LabVIEW. Uh, 
uh, because of the ease and speed of computing. It's a, it's a database of about 40 million cells uh, in, in its tables uh, for uh, describing the Quran uh, and in its complete format. And it's, uh, you know, how many, every word, every letter, every, every verse, front to back, back to front, location of every letter, um, in every ayah, every surah, every uh, across the entire Quran, um, you know uh, the recurrence of every letter, the recurrence of every word, the recurrence of verses, all all kinds of information. Actually, uh, these are all the different fields available in the in the database, right? And with uh, and there is this distinguish between first script, which is without the hamza. Uh, because the Arabic text of the Quran at the Prophet time was did not include Hamza uh, letter, and then it was added later on, and the, that becomes the modern text kind of. Um, but essentially, it works in in both Arabic and English, um, and you can uh, you know query, for example, uh, you can say I want um, it works on Windows. Uh, here I want to query. The verses that has Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There are four verses. They come right away, right? So, so you can. Uh, so this this has all the database that describes the Quran, um, and I, I'm providing a link for uh, uh, for downloading. And uh, you know, if you want to, you're interested in downloading, there's an English uh, training video on how to use it, and the Google Drive for <laughs> downloading. There's this Facebook post has instructions on how to install and other things, all right? Now, um, I want to build the Langshin libraries to, to query from this database, right? So that it's a retrieval augmentation kind of uh, uh, into an LLM. So I, I had a few, uh, I'll show it to you live a little bit, and then we can, uh, you know, here are some questions. So for example, uh, uh, I can I can say okay uh, let's run this. Uh, how many? What is the most recurring ayah in the Quran, and how many times it was uh, repeated? Right. Um, oh, sorry. Sometimes it has uh, these timing issues. So uh, let me just try. All right. Almost there. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, see, I, I think I have the, let's see, let's, I have the right database. One second. Uh, let's uh, switch. Uh, I, I I had my database originally in um, uh, in uh, MS SQL, sorry, MS Access, Microsoft Access, and I converted it to um, a SQLite and then Postgres as well. Uh, so I'm going to just switch the uh, database here. So that uh, performs better, <clears throat> right? So when you want to demo something, you always have. All right, let's see. Smart. Let's start. Let's try something else. Um, I think there's some. Uh, timing or because uh, sometimes it 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 works better when you repeat well like it doesn't work the first time second time it works <laughs> but that's not my problem that's i think the um, lang chain uh, may be related anyway here i asked it um how many ayahs have 114 letters and the, i asked the question in english right natural language and it builds the query, right? Builds the SQL query and brings the results and then shapes the answer in natural language back to the user, right? So that makes querying a database with natural language a lot more natural, a lot more uh, user-friendly and um, thought-friendly as well, right? So, um, so for example, here I'm going to... Uh, uh, ask, let's ask uh, how many times Muhammad was mentioned. Um, four times, right? It says mentioned four times. All right. Uh, 
I, I want to see if that this question uh, gets answered again or no. It's interesting. All right. I think something wrong maybe in how I stated the question. Um, <clears throat> in any case, um, let's uh, do... Um, I, I want to do something in uh, uh, in Arabic, right? So my database uh, column headers are all in English. Uh, but what what if I uh, mention something in Arabic? Uh, for example, let's see here. Um, so this is my uh, query in in Arabic. I say how many um, uh, how many verses in the Quran contain Bismillah Rahman Rahim, right? And how many words are between the first and second? Uh, uh, sorry, between the first and last occurrence of that. Um, let's see. Oh, I didn't uh, I'll uncomment that. Okay. Um, so it translated, my question is in Arabic, even though the database headers are all in English. So it found the, the right translation or correction between my Arabic words and English headers in the database. And it said, okay, yeah, there's two two uh, verses from Bismillah Rahman Rahim, first verse of Fatiha, and the second, Inahu min Sulaiman, wa Inahu Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in Surah al Naml, right? That's, and then it counted how many words are between them. So not only it translated, it queried, uh, and then did a mathematical calculation, uh, you know, between the first and second. So fairly complex operations that are happening pretty much uh, just through the uh, uh, integration between the SRAG uh, with uh, Langchain and the model, the language model itself. So that opens a door for a lot of applications um, in that, that are user-friendly, really. So uh, I in my slides, I will have a lot of examples that uh, you can go through them when you get them. Just considering time. Um, a Ray platform with any scale is uh, is uh, extremely good for parallel computing and uh, reliable and uh, ensures that when you're doing fine tuning, uh, if one GPU fails, you don't it doesn't interrupt the entire training session. You know, so that that kind of reliability throughout the training uh, and uh, reduces cost if you don't have to restart from the beginning, right? Uh, and there are some training uh, links here on Ray platform. All right. Um, so our plan is to, again, the support Ansari development, develop these plugins, do the fine tuning uh, of an open source on the Shamila library, translate a Shamila, maybe need to refine tune. I don't know yet. What we'll we'll see that when we get to get to that point uh, is is can when you train a language model on a Shamila in Arabic, will it be able to express it in English in adequate um, a sense without retraining? We'll work on that. And then developing these RAG for Quran and Hadith. Um, and um, yeah, and the last thing I want to mention in today's uh, uh, kind of presentation is how do we use these natural LLMs for code generation, right? So there are a lot of code generation because you know uh, automation of code is and uh, enabling higher productivity for engineers, particularly who are developing uh, ap applications and software, is very important. And um, sorry, okay, all right. And uh, and what we want to do is we want to do the. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, we want to be able to, uh, uh, you know, how do we how do we develop software or optimize software development with coding? Uh, I, I did want to show you the uh, text generation web UI, uh, which is this. This is the user interface for um, text generation web UI. You can um, uh, place a name of a bottle from from hugging face um, here and say download the model, then refresh it will be able to be in be in the menu 
for your models. I have lots of models loaded. You can load a model like, for example, here, uh, Mistral. Uh, you can load it. And this is run, running locally at the moment, right? So it's at uh, local, my local GPU on my PC. And it loads Mistral. Uh, it's, it's a 7 billion parameter model. We can, uh, it, it's fairly quick. But um, what I wanted to show you is while it's loading, uh, here it's successfully done, then you can chat with it. Um, like I can, you can chat with it in Arabic. Uh, uh, let me um, clear this here and let's chat with it in Arabic, say, um, or or in English. Um, you know, uh, what, what uh, I don't know what to ask him now. But, oh, this is okay. Um, uh, how, first, okay. Hal, okay, do you do you ask? Do you speak Arabic? And it says yes, I do. All right. So, so and it's fairly quick. Uh, I mean, the generation is is not bad at all. This is on my local thirty eighty, um, uh, Nvidia thirty eighty GPU. Uh, so running totally locally. Now here with uh, there's this uh, um, website called runpod.io and you can rent a GPU, um, even renting H100 if you like. Uh, this is um, decentralized. Like you can rent these as a, on, a, on, the, on the cloud, sorry, on the web somewhere, right? Uh, they, they manage the availability of the GPUs, et cetera. What's nice about RunPod is that it provides you this text generation web UI as a default. So when you when you uh, rent a GPU from them, the first thing you, you when you connect to the machine, uh, you're presented with, with is that is this interface. So you don't have to install anything or, or if you don't have a GPU and you don't have to install anything, immediately by running Rampad, you get this interface, right? But they don't run um, Ray platform. Uh, IO.net, on the other hand, is also decentralized uh, GPU renting, but it it does have this, um, uh, it does have this, uh, sorry. Uh, it does have um, Ray platform for distributed computing, okay? And the very last thing I wanna mention before we're done and open the questions is this Autogen. Um, Autogen is a Microsoft tool that allows you to define multiple agents uh, language as language models. So you can have described, just like, you know, Ansari described one character. With Autogen, you can describe mul multiple characters and mul those are multiple agents and you can have them talk to each other, each one performing a different role. For example, you can have one doing uh, being an expert in user interface, another in database, a third in uh, web uh, uh, content, another in as a quality engineer, and another as a project manager. And you can form a team of LLMs <laughs> roles, you know, uh, and you can have them interact and they discuss and, and iterate over a performing a task or a project. Uh, cool, uh, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, they might go haywire, <laughs> but uh, you might, and you might have to interrupt and control. Uh, so just, uh, but it's cool application. It's still at early stages, I would say. Uh, and they, uh, and another uh, MemGPT, in addition to Autogen was uh, a, a, an opportunity also because a lot of these LLMs have limited memory, context memory, or prompt memory, if you will. Um, like, you know, you're limited to uh, 16K uh, tokens or or 8K tokens. On, uh, Cloud2 came up with 100,000 100, tokens. And then GPT-4, uh, latest as of November 6, um, provided 128 tokens. Then... Cloud uh, came back and said, oh, we can give you 200,000 tokens. Okay, <laughs> right, good. But th those are, no matter how big they get, this number gets, 
uh, like this is 128K is about like a 300 page book or something. Um, uh, so if you wanna know how many words you multiply by 0.75, uh, like 75%, okay, is the number of words, uh, converting tokens to words, roughly speaking. But then MemGPT breaks that barrier by using your own local memory on the PC. So it's a different architecture and allows you to not have have unlimited context. So no matter how big the input is or the, the prompt is, um, it, you have infinite memory pretty much, um, uh, practically speaking, um, to prompt uh, and, and interrogate a language model. So that, that kind of opens up the, the context window or the prompt window uh, to as much text as you want uh, to query with. Um, obviously with commercial LLMs, those are all have costs, but with a local one, open source one, uh, you are able to do well. Uh, you can leverage this for your benefit, yeah. And I think this is all I had. Um, I hope it was uh, beneficial to all. Uh, I'll take any questions, yeah. Thank you very much for sharing your efforts uh, in this field. Uh, actually, I also did write it down to the chat box. Uh, it's my question. How do you think Islamic AI applications will affect the daily life of Muslims? Do you have concerns? Um, we have concerns that these apps can misinform people mm -hmm. because of hallucinations, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, for example, yeah. giving misleading fatwas. I think they they will be very useful um, for everyday interaction, and not only for Muslims, but also for non-Muslims who are trying to learn about Islam, uh, who don't have a sheikh right next door, you know, who can they can go and ask. Um, um, and or have that fear from uh, entering into this vast space and you know called Islam and they and uh, or maybe have uh, a, a, they're shy or maybe they don't want to appear as uh, lacking knowledge you know um, a lot of people fall into that situation a very large segment of people fall in, in that situ uh, situation and these language models, you know, really help transfer knowledge. It's like doing a Google search, but even better because you don't have to, oh, he, oh here is a million links you go through. You know, we found a million pages for you. You know, I, we don't want that. We want something uh, uh, right direct at my, my question, targeted and uh, 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 clear uh, in its content. So um, I'll, these LLMs will, will be answering more questions than any sheikh, uh, <laughs> you, you know, and um, and therefore it's, it's important to get it right, uh, especially when it comes to Quran and Hadith. We, as I mentioned, it's highly sensitive the information. We need it to be 100% accurate. And the RAG gives us that utility. Um, uh, uh, Fine-tuning it on a body of knowledge that is uh, um, recognized as uh, authentic, as valuable, such as in Maktab al-Shamila, is a very important step to building that Islamic knowledge, you know. Um, rather than uh, OpenAI, for example, doesn't declare where its data came from. It, they don't tell you. It might have come from Wikipedia, it could have been from social, uh, uh, social media. And that's where the danger is, right? Uh, you don't know. <laughs> you, then you're forming your, the, that Islamic knowledge is a is a consensus of social media comments. Uh, that's dangerous to have, you know. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when uh, our religious instructor uh, Sheikh uh, Sadchuk uh, heard about uh, Shamile. Uh -huh. He got excited because he also mentioned that it is one of our main sources. Great. We are searching a fatwa Great. for a, an information. So you are using it. Uh, thank you for that. One more question, uh, two more questions. Sorry. Sure. Uh, how uh, Ansari.chat differ from customized chat GPT? 
Can we create a customized chat GPT like Ansari.chat? Yeah, you can leverage uh, Ansari.chat is an open source and it controls chat GPT so that avoids a lot of the mistakes that GPT makes, right? Uh, by using, first of all, by using RAG or Quran and Hadith. Uh, and so the data, the, the results that are presented to the user are accurate and factual and true, right? Um, and then secondly, by by uh, controlling uh, GPT to be, to have that personality that draws upon upon specific body of knowledge that is the Sunni Islam, uh, Islamic sources, uh, and uh, with with the different um, you know Hanafi madhab or other madhabs that are Sunni you know uh, Sunni madhabs, and. Uh, actually, if you look at the open source, there is the, the system prompt define uh, that is stated there defines what that personality is, um, and you can use that open source to create new applications, build on it, or use it or improve it. You know, um, it's um, we're excited to see what people can come up with uh, with that. Um, like uh, use it for education um, uh, in schools uh, or uh, right. Um, uh, we do, uh, we did provide about a 500 uh, question test uh, of diverse topics, uh, Islamic on Islam, um, and to Ansari, and it passed with uh, 70, well, the score was 79% accuracy. Okay. All right. And the last question, does uh, Ansari.chat handle Turkish? I don't know. We can try it uh, and I'll try it quickly and see if the, if you get an answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any question? Our audiences. Uh, I I expected to speak Turkish because it's built on GPT four four, and if GPT four speaks Turkish, then Ansari will speak Turkish. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. We have two more questions. Sure. We have just got them. And one, are there any open source Arabic language models? Two, have you ever thought about pre-training a brand new model? Model, how much does it cost? Yeah. So, um, uh, I was hoping when Falcon was released that it would speak Arabic, um, because that was released by the United Arab Emirates. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> it speaks many languages, but not Arabic. So I was disappointed with that. Um, but hopefully that will get better in the future. Now, okay. Um, now, the uh, uh, Lama 2 um, was 90% of its 2 million token, uh, 2 trillion token, 90% of those were in English. And the remaining 10% were in so many different languages. Arabic is very minimal, almost non unmentionable, right? So if you ask it a question in Arabic, it answers you in English. Okay, so that doesn't really work very well. Uh, and that means if you use it for Maktab al-Shamila, you have to retrain it on Arabic much in a much better way, right? Um, now, Mistral is more capable in Arabic, even though it's smaller in size than Lama 2. Uh, this, this, oh, well, it's only 7B, I guess, 7B... Uh, parameters, 7 billion parameters. Uh, but it's, it speaks 200 languages. So its use or application for translation is uh, uh, very promising. Uh, and it speaks Arabic well. Uh, I, I can't tell you that it will understand necessarily every word in the Maktab al-Shamila, right? But, but I think that's something to discover and as we fine tune and train. Um, and that's where my question is, you know, can we depend on it for let's say post-training on an Arabic Al-Shamila, can we use it for translating Al-Shamila to English? You know, um, that's uh, something that uh, I'm curious to know the answer for. And uh, once we get there, we'll, we'll evaluate it. Um, I'm sorry, the, the last question uh, was, or the second question was, um, can you repeat that? The second question is, have you ever uh, thought about retraining a brand oh, yeah. model? How yeah, much does it cost? Right, it's it's very expensive. 
a uh, hundred million, two hundred million. You know, um, uh, Llama Two training took uh, uh, one point seven million hour GPU hours. So you can imagine how many GPUs they used to train Llama Two. Now Mistral was much more cost efficient. Uh, I think it's training. Um, that was uh, something like uh, in the hundreds of thousands only. Uh, I I don't know what's their secret uh, recipe to that, right? In this structure, but seems to be like a better model. Um, I was there will always be new new open source models coming, you know, that come every every few months or so. Uh, and we have to evaluate their capabilities in Arabic language. But training from beginning seems as out of reach for us as a nonprofit institute. Uh, fine tuning is uh, on limited data sets um, like uh, Maktab al Shamila, uh, maybe will cost us around 50K, maybe 70K or so. Um, uh, you know, that's more reachable, you know. Okay. Uh, okay, this, I, I, if it's okay, this will be the last question. Sure, uh, I'm, I have uh, to. I would like to announce to our uh, audiences, uh, because our guest is two hours forward uh, from us. He lives in Milwaukee. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, read the last question. Sure. Do you see any potential apps, areas that LLM will help, help Muslims youths for their Islamic education? Uh, yeah, certainly. I think um, this entire, uh, you know, ability to query a language model with um, a, a, and get a specific answer that is in context to your question um, is extremely uh, helpful in not only Advancing knowledge, but accelerating the time time frame in which you obtain that knowledge. Right, you can do things in a much faster time time frame that that way. And the fact that it can cross linguist language barriers. Right, uh, 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 you know, you can let's say uh, a knowledge that's present is trained on in English is also accessible in Arabic or Turkish or other languages. Right, um, that. Um, really is uh, a opens opens um opportunity for uh a, you know kind of global uh, uh reach uh, of of uh, of these llms to to um the target audience you know um i was uh, you know doing something and I, it kind of surprised me a little bit i was um uh you know here i said Kamara uh, Zukirat Muhammad, right? Muhammad is a word. Uh, so sorry, I'm sorry here in English, right? English question. I said, how many times the word ayah containing Muhammad was mentioned, right? And it says it said four times, right? But it it was interesting to me because uh, I, when I say something like, how many times the word treasure was mentioned in the Quran? Sorry, right? Treasure was mentioned in the Quran. And uh, treasure is is an English word here, but the Quran doesn't have the word treasure, right? It has kins, right? Uh, and will it will it cross language barriers uh, that way, right? So you ask a question, you're asking a question in um, in English. Sorry, I have to uh, deal with this bug. Sorry about that. Um, um, all right. Uh, any case, um, maybe I'll add add the slides. If it doesn't come up, I'll I'll add it. I'll add you the results uh, in the in the presentation and uh, before I send it out. Um, nonetheless, um, yeah, it it, it did uh, translate. It was searched for the word kins in Arabic in the Quran text, uh, which was very interesting. That it uh, you know not you know you have a text that is trained in. Uh, uh, if it says find it here. Okay, here it did not, but I don't know why. For um, uh, I showed it. I did try it, and I uh, it it 
put search for the word kins and it said it was it was found three times which is accurate um so in any case this is just an example but but um uh, you know i think the ability if you if you have data in a particular language and you ask about it or query it in a different language and the llm uh, uh, transforms that uh, question and the source, right? The relation between question and the source of data. Uh, even though they're totally different languages, it, it can uh, uh, bring them into the same context and provide the, the right answer. That is a truly amazing uh, ability you know, uh, of, the, of this language model. Um, and that enables a global reach for Islamic message, you know. Um, so I I think uh, uh, you know we can uh, uh, that's critical when you when you talk about religion across the world you know that that uh, people across the world will search and inquire about and in their own languages you know um, so it will accelerate the pace of uh, dawa it will accelerate the pace of pace of uh, a, um, uh, understanding you know. Uh, maybe mutual understanding between civilizations. I think that's important. And education. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, there is a feedback here. Ansari understands Turkish, but responds in English. Uh, responds in English, really? Okay. okay. Also, I'll give uh, feedback. Uh, by the way, if you do uh, feedback at ansari.chat, is the email. If you have any, any feedback on Ansari, please send it to feedback at ansari.chat. And uh, it will get to Dr. Walid uh, for. Uh, okay. Yeah. Improving. Thank you very much for right. attending uh, uh, tonight. Uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of our community. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Jazakallah, Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.